anti-Semitism itself was a made-up term by someone who hated Jews who thought it was not polite. This fellow by the name of Wil Wilhelm Marr uh, was a German politician and they had a word called Judenhaus, Jew hate. And he thought, gee, that, that, that makes it harder to get people hating Jews because it's just a little too boring. Yeah, this pseudo-scientific phrase, anti-Semitism, and he started the Anti-Semitic League, and that made hating Jews more palatable. And similarly, with the anti-Zionism, um, right after World War II, uh, the neo-Nazis who were left um, shifted to talking about Zionism. Um, and that was their that was that became the new terminology because they could be more a little more polite, um, as you know, quote unquote. Um, and they started the termination Zionist occupied government and a whole bunch of other terms like that that sort of in the in America um, on the far right. Uh, a fellow who you may have heard of, Harry Elmer Barnes, published a 1964 article where he, which he called the Zionist fraud. And he said, these are the people who are chiefly to blame for the misrepresentation of the swindlers of the crematoria, the Israeli politician who derived billions of marks from non-existent mythical imaginary cadaver. So, one of the things that I show on the far, I show in the book that I think is interesting and surprises a lot of people, is if you look at the phraseology from the far right and the far left, they are usually saying almost the same thing. I mean, as I mentioned before, Professor Salada uses very similar ideas to Professor Buck. And if you look at the anti-Zionism on the far right, uh, it sounds an awful lot like the anti-Semitism on the far left. I mean, David Duke re re um, posts, retweets um, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of what uh, uh, people who uh, Elon Omer's uh, Elon Omer's um, uh, uh, tweets that are anti-Israel, and yet they disagree on things as much as possible. I mean, David Duke even disagrees that she should have been allowed to come to the United States of America. But when it comes to that, people are, uh, people on the far right and far left can congeal. And here's the thing, is that when it comes to anti-Zionism, is what is anti-Zionism? Even if you take it by itself, it's saying the Jews should be the only people in the world not to be permitted to have a state. Every other group in the world should be permitted to have a state. And by the way, people who are anti-Zionist are very much Palestinian nationalists. Um, they think that Palestinians should have a state. But for some reason or another, only Jews and the entire planet should have a state. Because all Zionism is, is Jews wanting the right to self-determination. Right. In their indigenous land, where they've been, Jews have been since, by archaeological evidence, at least 3,000 years. Um, Biblical, uh, biblical, biblically a little bit longer, but even if you you, you forget about the Bible, um, over 3,000 years. So, it's anti-Zionism is, as we phrase it today, anti-Semitism. There's no difference. Right, it's like, as you say, it's, it would be like saying to an Italian, listen, I love Italians, I love your food, I love your culture, but I don't think there should be in Italy. Um, so, uh, I'm Orthodox. Christian, uh, not Orthodox Jew, but I, I would consider myself a Zionist because I, 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 I firmly believe, uh, you know, in, in the state of Israel, and I, sometimes I take some flack because I tend to be kind of an Israel, I take Israel later wrong, um, but can you be a Jew and be anti-Zionist? In other words, you're a Jew, but you deny Israel's right to exist. Well, here's the, here's the interesting thing, is again, it goes to the far right and the far left. They're definitely Jews, and there's a group called Jewish Voice for Peace, um, which is a ragtag group of um, people, Jews, who um, hate Israel. And 
Uh, it includes all sorts of academic, um, uh, uh, Daniel Boyerin, um, Cheryl McGee, Judith Butler, um, who are virulently anti-Israel. And, and, and it probably constitutes maybe 5 to 10 percent of the Jewish community that are that are anti uh, that are anti Zionists that for one reason or another they like to hang out with the cool kids and to be cool today in academia to be cool today in um, in the, on the far left one needs to be and we can talk about this later one needs to be anti Zionist and you can't be fully embraced on that side. But here's the thing that people don't get. There are crazy Jews always on one side or another. Just like Jews, uh, Jews are just like anybody else. There, there are folks who um, who believe strange things, no matter whether they're um, white, black, brown, whatever you know, whatever, or pink with purple polka dots. And so you have Jews who also deny the Holocaust. Um, there is. Um, David Cole, who's a filmmaker who's tried to write um, films questioning the Holocaust. There's Moshe Arya Friedman, who gets a lot of press. He claims to be a rabbi who denies the Holocaust. There's Nat Daniel Kepner. Um, there's Bobby Fischer, the chess, the, 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 the chess champion, Paul Eisen. So you can have crazy Jews, just like any other group. There are Jews who are crazy, and that's, um, you know, that's the way of the world. But by and large, most Jews believe that they should have a state with all of its flaws. I mean, the Jewish state is one like any other state in that it's not perfect. I'm certainly not going to claim that it's perfect. Um, uh, the, on the, on the, uh, on the, on the academic class, they say there's compulsory Zionism. You have to say that everything is good about Israel. There's some things that are, you know, that could use some improvement, like any other place. But Jews, the Jewish state is held to a different standard. It has to be somehow perfect. It has to be willing to have its own citizens killed in order to um, uh, meet the standards of the uh, far left and far right, which, which is crazy. And, and when you have these far right and far left movements, um, sometimes they are even against other sorts of you know, nationalism, but they coalesce really around in the world only being against the, the, the Jewish state. I mean, the, Democrat, the Democratic Socialists of America have uh, lots of planks, and yet when it comes to foreign policy, Basically, they just have one plank that's discernible, and that is they're against the Jewish state. They're against Israel, and that somehow one foreign policy plank has become a litmus test. But where is the line, Scott, or is there a line when uh, criticism of the Israeli government becomes anti-Zionism or anti-Semitism? Well, here's the thing, is that if you read, again, the far right and far left, it's more than just criticism of the government. It's that the state shouldn't exist. I mean, the boycott, the best and sanction movement, so-called BDS, says that there should be no Jewish state between the river and the sea, which means that, which means that there just should be no Jewish state. Um, Saying that you can that, that the, the Gaza regime can launch 5,000 missiles literally against Israel, and Israel shouldn't have the right to respond and defend itself. That crossed the line. That's saying Jews should just be dead in both of those cases. I mean, the backing Hamas, which BDS does, whose who's charter. Um, and not only charter, but policies and public proclamations are that every Jew between the Mediterranean and the Jordanian Jordan River should be uh, exterminated or perhaps expelled. Uh, that's not, 
you don't say, well, I agree with, I disagree with the Italian government on something, and therefore every Italian, you know, from um, uh, from the tip of Italy to um, its border with the next country should be exterminated or expelled. I mean, but somehow that's acceptable when it comes to talking about on the far left and the far right talking about Jews. It is pure Jew hatred. You, you mentioned BDS, yeah. the BDS movement, and again, a huge uh, online footprint, digital footprint. It's everywhere online, and it seems to be, unfortunately, very popular with uh, with young people on college campuses and university campuses, also in Canada. But explain a little bit more about BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. What is what is going on here? Yeah, well, you would think BDS, the, the idea is boycott, divest, and sanction from a country that is doing evil things, and therefore. There should be no, as they put it on the far left, no normalization. Or in the far right, they essentially uh, dehumanize. It's the same thing. Denormalization is, again, the, the same thing on the far right and far left. Which is, um, interestingly, it's only, it's a tool only wielded against the Jews. Which um, is... Uh, also disingenuous, disingenuous, but it's become the cause, it's become the cause to love on campus that there should be no normalization, no dealing with Israelis and increasingly with any Jewish organization because they may be tainted by somehow Israel. And the, um, the, the leaders of, of, of BDS are quite quite clear. They're for the eradication of Israel. Um, and if you listen to, I, I mentioned in the book uh, a speech that Jasper Poor makes, but so does Omar Bugatti, who's the leader of BDS and others, where they basically acknowledge that BDS by itself is not the, not the goal. We're counting or trying to get Israel to change its policies by BDS is not the goal. The goal is to bring the rest of the world to accept that if Israel is wiped out, that's okay, because Israel is so very evil. And it's similar, sadly, to what happened pre-World War II, where there were more conspiracy theories about Jews than there were Indo-European languages in Europe, and that Jews were considered super duper evil. In my father's hometown of Spexner, there were two blood libels, one before he was born, one uh, when he was a young boy, that again were totally made up. The one when he was a boy was about someone who had been supposedly murdered, the blood, his, the, the person's blood used for his and that stuff, but the, 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 the young man turned up in perfect health. Um, and there was this sad view that if you make up stuff about Jews, if when the time comes and the programs come, it'll be easier for others to look away. And that's exactly what happened, unfortunately, in 1941 when the Nazis marched into Sexner. Everyone not only looked away, but all the Jews who were hiding in the vicinity were handed over because these were clearly, clearly, in the views of these folks prepared by these conspiracy theories to be extraordinarily evil people. And even if you liked an individual Jew, they were a moneyed, they didn't have any money, but they were a moneyed evil cabal. And that's the potency of using these conspiracy theories, and BDS is part and parcel of that, to prepare people to do terrible things against a targeted population. And that's why I mentioned in the beginning uh, what happened to the Hutas and the Armenians and others. And look at, look at even in modern day, in the modern day, I mean, the Chinese government prepared the, its population, in particular in the Xinjiang province, with conspiracy theories about the Uyghurs. Yes. Before they started their 
mass incarceration project. And they've done the same thing, they did the same thing years ago against the Tibetans. Um, so this is part and parcel of how, well, let me put it this way, and, and this is something I point out in the book, is that the best way to hack social psychology is with a conspiracy theory, because you get right to people's pathos, you get right to their emotional connection, and then you can get them to do and agree to doing all sorts of terrible things, or, or and certainly sit out while other people are doing terrible things. Scott, we've got to take a time out here. We're approaching the top of the hour. We'll come back and uh, discuss further. <clears throat> Scott Shea, author of Conspiracy You, a case study. Here is uh, Jim Croce, one of my favorites, long time ago on Coast to Coast AM. Seems like such a long time ago. I was walking on a lonely road, getting tired of dreaming alone.
Please use other options. OP Deputy Health Officer Dr. Regina Tencio Kwong says more than 30% of recent ER visits have been COVID related. I don't know about you. I don't want to go to a hospital if I have no symptoms because if anything, that's where I'm going to get exposed because there's other people who are coughing, snoozing, and have symptoms. So really, you should not go to the hospital if you are not symptomatic and just speaking for a test. She says ambulance drop-off times are up to 53 minutes. Ambulance diversions to other hospitals have been suspended. And hospitals are dealing with staffing shortages because so many people are sick. In Orange County, Corbin Carson, KFI News. Cedar sinai Medical Center in L.A. is having a blood shortage. The hospital is asking anyone who's able to donate to please do so. If you want to donate, you can register online. O negative blood is known as the universal donor blood type and is needed because it can be given in emergency situations when a patient's blood type is unknown. O positive blood is the second most needed because it's the most common blood type found in about 37% of the population. Thousands of people in the Sierra Nevada are still without power, heat, or running water almost two weeks after a storm moved through, dumping snow on the area. The storm hit December 26th. PG&E says most households have power back, but crews are still working on the 7,000 still in the dark. Disability advocates say the prolonged outage has especially been hard for people with health issues who use motorized wheelchairs, ventilators, respirators, and apnea monitors. The sister of a federal security officer allegedly killed by members of the Boogaloo movement is suing Facebook. The suit alleges the tech company played a part in radicalizing the two men by promoting violent content and connecting extremists from the Boogaloo group to the accused killers. The security guard and his partner were attacked at a federal building in Oakland in May of 2020. Facebook says the claims in the lawsuit have no legal basis. South Dakota Republican Senator John Thune has announced he will run for re-election this year. Thune is the second-ranking Republican in the Senate and had been considering retiring. He fell out of favor with then-President Trump when he spoke out against Trump's assertion the 2020 election was rigged. SoCal weather from KFI, partly cloudy then sunny by the afternoon, highs in the upper 60s to low 70s at the beaches, low 70s in Metro LA and OC, mid 60s to low 70s in the Inland Valleys, upper 60s to low 70s in the Inland Empire. And there's a wind advisory until 2 this afternoon in the Inland Valleys. Right now it's 46 degrees in Sherman Oaks, 46 in Culver City, 48 in Brea, and 46 in Irvine. We lead local from the KFI's 24-hour newsroom. I'm Brian Bruman. Checking KFI traffic, we do have a work zone in the Long Beach area, 91 eastbound from the 7th end of Cherry. Four left lanes coming off until 9 a.m. Through Bellflower on the 91 eastbound from Bellflower Boulevard to the 605. Two left lanes coming off there until 9 a.m. And we have a crash in the Burbank area, 5 north on a Hollywood Way that's blocking the right lane. KFI in the sky helps get you there faster. I'm Jonathan Weiss. Hi, I'm Tom with Owning Mortgage. With today's rising home values and low mortgage rates, we're doing refis that let you pull out tens of thousands in cash. Use that cash to take control of high-interest credit cards, car loans, do things around the house, or anything you want. My husband and I realized the best, low-cost way to get a large chunk of cash was to take advantage of our home's value by refinancing. Tom got us a low interest rate, and we pulled $50,000 in cash out. We paid off high-interest credit cards and a few other things. Owning made the whole process super easy. Yeah. Only is designed to save with great 30-year fixed rates. So call today and let us tell you how much money you may have sitting in your house. Call Owning at 833-2-OWNING or go to owning.com. Your house can be like a bank. NMLS 2611. Licensed by the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation in the California Residential Mortgage Lending Act. Subject to credit approved for qualified borrowers. Call 833-303-2161 for terms and conditions. Equal housing lender. So call 833-2-OWNING or go to owning.com. That's 833-2-OWNING or owning.com. I feel like I'm being haunted by a pair of headphones. Everywhere I go is a creepy ad for headphones I've looked at one time. I hate that feeling like I'm being watched. I downloaded DuckDuckGo and saw a difference right away. See back your privacy online with DuckDuckGo. Privacy simplified. Rates subject to change without notice. Certain restrictions and minimum loan amount requirements apply. 60% LTV and 625 score. Subject to credit approval by refinancing your existing loan. Your total finance charges may be higher over the life of the loan. NMLS 3290. Loans made or arranged pursuant to California financing law license. Number 6036970. Equal housing lender. Home loan rates are incredibly low. If you recently refinanced and your rate is higher than 2%, call Intel alone. Here's Steve who refinanced last year and was certain he had a great rate. I refinanced last year and I saved a ton of money. I thought I had a great rate. So doing another refinance wasn't even a consideration. But just recently I got curious. Could I save money again? I was shocked to find out I could save money. I thought I had a great rate. If you've refinanced recently and you haven't asked if you could save money again, you should ask. 
Be like Steve and ask again. Intel alone is offering a 1.99% fixed rate and APR with no points and no lender fees. A 1.99%. Call 1-800-918-6200. That's 1-800-918-6200. Or go to IntelAlone.com. Intel alone. Claro, smart. Our lives are filled with choices. What's not a choice? Addiction to opioids. But even with opioid use disorder, you still have a choice. Choose treatment and choose change California. Find medically proven treatment options at choosechangeca.org. You wouldn't trust a butcher to babysit your pet pig. You wouldn't trust a lumberjack to repair your antiques. Or a professional wrestler to be your massage therapist. So why would you trust anyone but AMCO to fix your car? For over 50 years, we've been the trusted experts in transmission repair. Check engine light on, we'll check it for free. Limited time offer, restrictions and exclusions apply. See participating centers for full details. Double A, NCO. Hi, how are you? Earth knows small changes can make a big difference. Want to reduce your food waste? Embrace your freezer. From bread to meat and even seeds, most foods can be frozen and cooked later. Plus, a full freezer uses less electricity. Brought to you by iHeartRadio Earth and the National Environmental Education Foundation. To find more tips for smarter, sustainable living or to take action in your own community, go to iHeartRadio.com slash Earth. I'm Stephen Rinell, the host of the Meat Eater podcast and the Netflix original series Meat Eater. As a hunter and wildlife enthusiast, the question comes up, how can you justify killing and eating animals that you love and protect? Well, that's part of what we wrangle with on the Meat Eater podcast along with broader and often funnier discussions about living an outdoor life in the modern world. We insist on sharing challenging opinions to inspire thoughts and action. Listen to the Meat Eater podcast on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. American Vision Windows, SoCal's choice for energy-efficient windows and doors. AmericanVisionWindows.com Good morning, everyone. This is KFI AM640, more stimulating talk. Don't forget that you can catch KFI everywhere and anytime on the iHeartRadio app. My name is Oscar Ramirez. I'm the host of The Daily Dive, a daily news podcast covering some of the top stories making waves in the news. You can catch a new episode of The Daily Dive Monday through Friday on iHeartRadio, and it's ready for you when you wake up. Here on The Daily Dive Weekend Edition, I'll be bringing you some of the best stories I covered during the week. As we've entered into this new year, COVID cases continue to rise in the U.S. as the Omicron variant proves to be highly transmissible. The rise in infections has reignited the conversation over masks and how some doctors and healthcare systems are saying that cloth masks may not be enough. They're recommending that you pair them with surgical masks or upgrade to other options like KN95 masks. For more on what to know about masks, we'll speak to Nidhi Subaraman, science reporter at the Wall Street Journal. So we see masks come back up in conversation cheaply, I think, as you pointed out, because experts are worried about how transmissible Omicron is among people who are not vaccinated, but also even among people who are. So though we know that vaccines are, uh, you know, a top form of checking the virus, either from getting sick uh, seriously, people are looking to other aspects of defenses against the virus, like masks, in order to stop this more transmissible variant to the extent that we can. Yeah, and you know, we're seeing the response already come from uh, companies and, uh, and other places. For example, my wife, she works in an office. They were supposed to go back to work this week after the holiday break. They sent an email out saying, nobody's coming back, we're working from home this week. And now the only acceptable masks to wear in the office are the KN95 masks, which they provide them and all. But still, they're, they're setting those limits already, saying, you know, this is the only thing you can wear for now. That's really interesting. We've heard from doctors who are recommending that people switch over to a stronger version of a mask beyond just a cloth mask. I think since the beginning of the pandemic, there has generally been an accepted understanding among experts that the more sophisticated masks offer better protection, but that any kind of masking offers some level of a barrier against the transmission of this virus. We know and we have known for some time that they are transmitted in droplets when you breathe in and breathe out. And people initially suspected that even the tinier, tinier particles might carry the virus. And since then, it's been confirmed that they do transmit as well in these tiny droplets. And the more robust masks, the KN95 grade or the N95 grade, 
can better stop those tinier particles from spreading as well. And, you know, with Omicron being so widely prevalent, I think the thinking is that your chance of encountering this is increased. So if you can protect yourself and protect other people, this is something you, you should be able to do. Right. In your article, you posted an interesting graph that kind of shows, you know, how long it would take to be exposed to COVID you know, if somebody was infected and wore a mask or didn't wear a mask, vice versa, what kind of mask, and, you know, and a person that was not infected, if they were in the same room, how long it would take. And if nobody's wearing anything, you know, in a matter of 15 minutes, you've been exposed and you could be infected already. You know, if you start wearing these surgical masks and N95 masks, you know, it, it obviously takes a lot longer. If both people are wearing surgical masks, it could take up to an hour before uh, you, you might be infected. If you're wearing these N95 masks, it's like 25 hours, you know, so the type of mask, the protections they provide, the better they are, obviously, they do help out a lot. Absolutely, yeah, and some of it has to do with the way they are structured in terms of the layers that they are placed one over the other. Some of the KN95, uh, some of the surgical masks have a material uh, that is like a plastic that has a electrostatic charge that traps the particles better, so better, you know, stops them from moving around. The other thing that experts point to really as far as making the most effective use of these is really the fit. So I know it's easy to have, you, if you have your glasses on and your mask underneath and you sort of tip it around so that it doesn't fog things up, but really having a super tight feel around your face is part of making sure that these are working as they ought to, because in as much as you want the particles from being prevented from going through the mask, if they're coming up over your nose or, you know, in gaps, that is something that one needs to be watching out for as well. We know that the, obviously the conversation is going around right now, that's why we're talking about it, but what is the official guidance from the CDC right now on this? Because they're not saying, they're not, they're still, you know, they want any, anybody to mask up any way as possible just to help out as much, but they have even said, you know, maybe double masking is a smart choice. Yeah, I think there are some experts who would like the CDC to come out pretty specifically and say this mask over that mask and say that some masks are better than others or even recommend people use a certain kind of mask. The time this came up recently is uh, when the CDC changed its isolation guidelines for people who've been infected with COVID-19 and they proposed that they can come away from isolation if they're asymptomatic after five days potentially, but keep a mask on for a certain period of time after that to keep protection at its max. Well, we'll see how the conversation continues around this. Obviously, we're, we're seeing the Omicron variant spread very quickly, so just uh, be safe and, and protect yourself. Nidhi Subaraman, science reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. In a concern for military readiness, we're looking at 30,000 active duty service members that still have yet to be vaccinated, despite mandates and some deadlines already passing. Now, to be clear, the vaccination rate stands at more than 97%, but some are instead resigning or facing honorable discharges rather than taking the shots. Lawsuits are pending and thousands have requested religious exemptions, although none have been granted. For more on all this, we'll speak to Melissa Hernandez, reporter at the LA Times. It's an interesting thing because, you know, obviously when we think about the military, we think about the fact that these are people who are given these lawful orders and they're told to abide by these orders without really questioning it. And this is one of the first instances where we're really seeing that pushback and that defiance from troops who are making this claim and putting their stake in the ground by saying, no, I understand I am a soldier of the military and I am part of these branches, but I'm going to refuse that. It's been something that has been an interesting thing to follow because it's been evolving so fast. I mean, as you mentioned, we do have 97% of our forces are fully that, which is fantastic. But when you have this microcosm of about 30,000 active duty service members that are defying the mandate, that brings up the question of military readiness, which is essentially the biggest concern that we have. So it's been very interesting, you know, obviously getting to talk to people and hearing their perspectives on it and the various reasons of why people are choosing not to get vaccinated. You know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's interesting. Totally. No, and, th and that's uh, what I wanted to point to next, right? You know, we hear a lot of stories. We know there's a lot of uh, service members that are already going through it, and some of them had made the choice to not get vaccinated, maybe leave, resign, however. But you did talk to a couple of people, uh, some young people, cadets at West Point, in fact, who are starting their careers, basically, hoping to become officers, going through that whole route. 
And uh, I think he spoke to a pair of people who resigned, who left West Point because of it. That was very interesting because, you know, I'm sure if you're familiar with the military, you understand that when you sign up for this, there is an initial commitment that you have to fulfill, whether that could be four, five, or six years. And what we're seeing is cadets at West Point, or even just that enlist in the Army, 18, 19 years old, are rescinding now their commitments and they're choosing to step away, most of them with honorable or generally under honorable conditions. And there's a big difference between both of those, but it's interesting because it makes you think, so what happens to these people that choose to leave early after the military has already invested so much money into them? You know, at West Point, there is a two-year commitment after you start, where if you leave after your first two years, you do have to pay that money back to the military. So it kind of makes you think, like, what are the reasons of why people are leaving? Obviously, we heard an array of things from everybody that we spoke to, but it makes you wonder what happens to these people, you know, when the military has invested so much money. In the case of West Point, I think their tuition is about $400,000. We put all this money into them, and now they're leaving. That's something to think about. Now, and tell me a little bit more, if you could, about the discharge, because it is an honorable discharge if you do refuse this. So at least for, for some people getting a uh, dishonorable discharge. I mean, all that carries all sorts of other implications for your future. So at least they're not going that way, which is pretty good, I guess. Absolutely. And the fact that they're not getting dishonorable discharges is something that has been as of recent. So President Biden did sign the National Defense Authorization Act in the evening of December 27th, and there is a specific clause in there that does prohibit dishonorable discharges for service members who are refusing to get vaccinated. Now, when we were writing this story in the middle of December, that was not the case at the time. The military, and particularly with the Army, who is the ones that I spoke to the most, they had plans in place to start dishonorably discharging troops who were refusing the mandate. So now we're seeing that people are getting to separate from the military for refusing these lawful orders, but they still get to keep all of their benefits and all of their pensions, all of their VA stuff. So that's a very, very interesting development, and that was something that came up as we were writing. So it was a lot of back and forth and trying to figure out what exactly is going to happen to these troops going forward. And even as of now, with the Authorization Act signed, we don't really know because those policies by the Secretary of Defense and all of the individual military branches have not been solidified. You're listening to the Daily Dive Weekend Edition on KFI AM 640 and everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about service members defying vaccine orders. Radio Earth knows small changes make a big difference for the environment. Did you know that keeping your tires even a single PSI lower than recommended means worse mileage and more trips to the pump? So do the environment and your wallet a favor and always check the tire pressure. Brought to you by iHeartRadio Earth and the National Environmental Education Foundation. To find more tips on smarter, sustainable living or to take action in your own community, go to iHeartRadio.com slash earth. And while caregiving can be demanding, it can also be very rewarding, summoning the best of our humanity. Contributing to family members' well-being can have undeniable and long-lasting positive effects for both the patient and the caregiver. California's Paid Family Leave Program provides partial wage replacement benefits to California workers who take time off from work to care for an ill family member. This is your moment. The moment to care for your aging parent or grandparent. To be there to help them when they truly need it. To lend a helping hand, or just a hand to hold. If you have an ailing parent or grandparent, paid family leave can provide you with up to eight weeks of partial wage replacement to give you the time you need to give them the attention they need. This is your moment. Take it. To learn more, visit CaliforniaPaidFamilyLeave.com. Moments matter. Serving part-time in the Army National Guard has led to a lot of firsts for me. It paid for me to be the first person in my family to go to school. That education got me to the first day at my dream job, which I can still hold while I serve part-time. That job and the home loan benefits I got from the Army National Guard helped me buy my first house. 
I also know that I will be one of the first to respond if my community ever needs me. Sponsored by the California Army National Guard. Aired by the California Broadcasters Association and this station. IQ Air wants to give you the cleanest air possible, and the affordable Autumn Series does just that. The Autumn Desk is a revolutionary air purifier that transforms your workspace into personal clean air zone. Unlike other air filtration systems that may take hours to purify the air, the Autumn Desk begins working immediately. Put it right next to you while you work and create your own personal bubble of ultra-pure air. This game-changing technology has been proven to remove 99% of all airborne pollutants. Visit iqair.com slash us to learn more. Give them a call. 800-500-4AIR. 800-500-4247. Yes, I know. I have a calming demeanor. You know when it's your job basically to push people beyond their comfort zones? It's good to make them feel as safe as possible. Like an open heart surgeon for your home. You'll do fine. No worries. We got this. Home with Dean Sharp. The House Whisperer. This morning at 9 on KFI AM 640. More stimulating talk. This is KFI AM 640. I'm Oscar Ramirez, and you're listening to the Daily Dive Weekend Edition. When people are talking about reasons why they're refusing the vaccine, what are you hearing? I'm assuming it mirrors a lot of what we see in the general public. Vaccines might not be ready. They're too new. I know there's a lot of people looking for religious exemptions, although I think uh, there's been a lot of those put out there, uh, or a request for them at least, and the military hasn't granted any of those. No, so we've seen across every single military branch that there's been receival of thousands of religious exemptions, and every single one of them has been denied. Now, obviously, people that I spoke to, there was a gamut of reasons why they chose not to get vaccinated. Some of them were religious reasonings, and they all had their reasons to cite. But what was interesting is some of the reasons that I also got was just the fact that people don't want to be told what to do. And that is ironic when you're hearing that from the military coming from, you know, you're given a lawful order, you are told this is what you have to do, and you get that pushback of being told no. So it's a gamut of things. I mean, obviously people do have concerns over vaccine safety, which is understandable. But, you know, when you talk to people that tell you that, you know, they served deployments and they were back in the Marines where they took the anthrax vaccine, which at the time when anthrax came out in the late 90s and they mandated it, there was controversy surrounding that and people did push back, but not to the extent that we're seeing with the COVID vaccine. Right. So And the military been, has a long history of, of mandating these vaccines and, and all this other stuff help for health reasons to keep the troops healthy. Absolutely. And it all boils down to military rights. And that is the most important thing. Obviously, we need to make sure that troops are safe and that they are protected. Yeah, yeah, okay. The service, especially those who are active duty, we need to make sure that they're ready. It was the same thing like when the Jews came to the World War II era when they started mandating it. There were reasons why the field officers did not overtake the military branches because they had this vaccine in place and there was that trust in science that they're not going to protect their soldiers. So they're not going to protect their soldiers. Yes, 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 yes. Carried over with the COVID vaccine. Yeah, you see, this is an ongoing story. I know there's some deadlines that have passed, there's others that have yet to come. You know, in the end, we'll have to see how many troops do leave or, or get the discharge, but an uh, ongoing story for now. Melissa Hernandez, reporter at the other time. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっ